Here I can. Right. Hey. How are you, Matthew? Hey, hey, good. Hey, thanks for giving us a little tour today, Brian. We've got a group of probably about 12 or 15 people here on the Zoom call, and as well, we got a awesome. Of people okay. Us on Facebook Live. That's as fantastic. Well. Okay. So, what we just we'd like for you to just show us a little bit about the orchard and tell us a little bit about it, and maybe we could ask a few questions as you go through, if that's yeah, all right. Yeah, absolutely. So we are um, we are walking through a glow a block of glow havens. Um, these were picked yesterday, and so what we do is we go through and we pick all the riper stuff out of the block. Each peach is checked by hand, and then um, harvested according to ripeness. And oh. Um, yeah, they're so, uh, yeah, so each peach is uh, checked by hand for ripeness, and then we harvest according to, um, to uh, just the, the, uh, pressure, the pressure or the give on each peach. Um, so each week, the guys go through and fill, fill them and, uh, and pick whatever's ready, and, and then we, um, we wait a day, and then on the third day, we go back in and do it again. So, yeah. So, uh, this is kind of our mid-season peach. This is like our first uh, freestone peach, which means it comes off the pit and you can can it and use it for processing and cooking and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, How many varieties of peaches do you guys raise out there? I think we have like, I think it's 17 right now. And a lot of them, we have staple varieties, which, which consist of more um, like uh, Red Haven, Glow Haven, uh, Crest Haven, Sun Crest. Are kind of our staples and then we also we grow we grow a lot more varieties we do a lot of test varieties to see what has flavor and what what's going to what's going to work out long term for you know commercial production um if we 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 have a lot of we have a lot of test varieties that just don't hit the mark for whatever reason um some are uh some some freeze easier in the spring and we since we're in colorado we have uh problems with frost and so, you know, that's a, that's a big concern, but um, yeah. So we're always trying to be up on, on top of the best flavored stuff. And, you know, if there's something better out there, we want to be the, you know, the first to, to kind of get on board and, and, you know, start growing it. Um, and we also try, we, we really try to time varieties. So what we want is um, there's, there's basically four blocks of, uh, of timing. So there's early mid season, mid late season and then late season and so we're trying to have um equal production throughout that whole time frame and that way if we get rainstorms or something like that we don't have a we don't have a big lapse in in production and that way we can be consistent in getting everybody their orders and you know making sure that everybody's uh uh happy with what they're getting and we're not late on on getting stuff out so but yeah what, so you just listed a bunch of different varieties. We're scheduled, yours coming from you, they're supposed to be loaded in a truck about August 11th. So what variety or varieties would be on that truck? Do you know? Off the that, could be, that could be Glow Havens from another farm. We, we have 21 different farms and they're all smaller. They're all smaller farms under 40 acres per, per farm. And uh, those will, so we'll, we might be still be in Glowhaven or we might be moving into uh, Suncrest and Glowing Star by that time. And so Sun, uh, Glo, uh, they're, all, they're all excellent varieties, all freestone. Um, uh, the Glowing Star is a little bit redder. It has a little bit more color to it. Um, Suncrest as well has a little more color to it. These are, uh, these are, let's see. A little these are kind of a more of a yellow like a yellow uh peach with um uh just a just a touch of red and this is really our first commercial variety that i'm that i'm proud actually proud of um some peaches right here that are kind of ready and um but yeah these these have good density to them the earlier fruit has kind of a you know minimal amount of density and um they're juicy, but they, when you bite into them, there just isn't that, uh, that flesh that you want, you know, like kind of more like a steak. You want, you want some density to the, that peach when you bite into it and gives her a better texture. So, um, sugar content is de determined really by like the amount of light that comes into the tree. 
And so if you, you want, you want good growth because you want a healthy tree to grow nice big peaches, but you also want a lot of, you want plenty of light coming through and you can see, you know, we have, we have pretty good light in this block. Um, if we overgrow the trees, we'll have, we won't have enough light coming through the bottom and there can be issues with flavor and uh, hold on a sec. Sorry. Keep getting calls. Um, yeah, so we, so, so we're always trying to, trying to keep, uh, keep everything managed really well and that way we have great sugar content um you know like enough sunlight to give it some really good flavor and then uh we we work a lot do on our soils too for flavors so we do um we use compost and as our main for, source of uh, nitrogen and uh then we also subsidize with a little bit of uh of urea uh fertilizer when when needed um, so we also, we do a lot of, um, we, we use a lot of organic inputs and if, if we, if, if it's cost, um, prohibitive, then we, we use conventional at, when we're selling conventional fruit, but really our, our pro, our spray program is really minim, minimum toxicity. Um, you know, our kids eat the fruit too. So we want to, we, we really want to protect our employees and have, uh, you know, have some good quality stuff for everybody to feed their families. So um yeah any questions i've got one more that just came in online and then we'll see if anybody else does as well um yeah. one actually one question says western colorado right like that's where you're from yeah so our farm is in palisade which is right right by grand junction we're in we're at, in the east end of the valley by grand junction and then we're right below grand mesa which is a is a, uh a mountain that gets snow and has uh, a ski area and stuff. So we have a lot of the cool air, cool air kind of funnels off that at night and gives us uh, temperature fluctuation. And that helps to build uh, sugar content in fruit. So usually the best fruit on the planet will come from a spot that's at the base of mountains. And kind of the same thing with wine, wine grapes or fruit or anything like that. Uh, where you're trying to get flavor and sugar to combine, um, it'll usually come where you have really hot days and then cool nights. So kind of something we've picked up over the years. Another question that came in is what about irrigation? Irrigation is a big thing here in Nebraska for corn yeah. and other products. Is that produce, is that something you guys have to do a lot of or not so much? Yeah, we, we irrigate this, these orchards get irrigated right now. It's been 96, 97 degrees every day. And we, we irrigate them about once a week. And so once every seven days, the orchards are irrigated for 24 hours. And so um, if it cools off or we get rain, then we will back that off. And I think the least we'll irrigate is about every 14 days and the most is seven. Um, and somewhere in the middle, depending on, you know, the temperature fluctuations and stuff. So is there, is it like a drip line or how does it get your, get your um, yeah, it's so it's, uh, these Israeli sprinklers, they're called Nandans and we have hanging, it's, it's hung on a trellis and the trellis goes through the orchard. And so these spray and, and then they go all the way across every, every tree has, uh, every tree has a sprinkler. So and then they they overlap so you get the whole root zone so what you're looking at is our cover crop and then um the sprinkler system there and then this is this area we want clean for the trees so that that way they're not feeding with weeds um we use uh in this orchard i have just some grass and then also white dutch clover and we we did have uh let's see alfalfa in here but the soil is good enough now that i don't i don't need um I don't need the alfalfa to continue to, you know, to continue to break up the, <clears throat> break up the um, hard pan layer. And so the uh, white Dutch clover gives a little bit of nitrogen back to the soil too. So it's kind of a net zero, it's kind of a net zero with the grass and the clover. Um, but it also puts a lot of uh, uh, micronutrients back into the soil. So the trees are kind of uh, working with the cover crop um, to, to get what both need. So it's important to have, it's important to have a cover crop where you have orchard. Um, otherwise your trees basically deplete the soil and um, uh, long, long term, you're kind of just robbing the soil for all the nutrition. And our, our goal is to kind of build the soil while growing fruit 
and put back into it what we're taking out of it and just have a really balanced uh, uh, environment out here. Um, we also add a lot of earthworms in, into our soil. So we have some red, I can't remember, it's red something earthworm and then uh, uh, night crawlers are added. So and that's kind of a long-term deal, but where we've, where we put the worms in, we're getting worm castings and that, that's helped to build the soil a lot. So if it rains, the ground is just covered with all these earthworms and they're going through and chewing up all the organic matter and whatnot in the soil and leaving the castings. And then the, the castings are really uh, good for, for the trees. And so it's, you know, we're, we're always playing with that. And then we um, are, we get all our water out of the Colorado river and the pH is roughly 8.0 to 8.2, which is kind of alkaline. And so we burn sulfur um, and then inject the, uh, the, sulf the sulfur gas back into the water. And that, to, that basically is just acid. It's clean, you know, pure acid. And that drops the pH of the water that we're putting out here down to uh, either neutral or we go a little acidic just because all, all the years of putting that 8.0 or 8.2 water down, we, we're going a little acidic to try to rebalance the pH of the soil back to kind of a neutral level. Um, each is like a little bit acidic soil, but not, not much. So, but. I have a question for Brian. Yeah. So uh, what is the average uh, lifespan of production of a tree? And then what are your major insects and diseases? Um, the trees last, I would say on average, 20 to 25 years. Um, where we're putting in high density, they're lasting maybe 15 to 18 years, which means the spacing. So this block is not high density. So the trunks on these are really big. Um, these are 10 by 15 spacing. Uh, so these, this, this block, sorry, got a phone call there. Uh, this block will last probably 35 years. Um, whereas if I go, let me see if I have a high dense. No, I don't have one close. Um, uh, the uh, high density are on a five foot by 15 foot spacing. And those, those uh, the roots compete with each other. So you get production faster, but you also uh, lose the trees a lot sooner. And then our major insect problems are twig borer, um, crown borer, aphids, uh, which is a peach aphid, um, spider mites, um, hmm, uh, rust, rust mite, um, earwig, uh, numerous other insects, but those are the main ones. Um, but yeah. We use predatory insects as well. So on, on all our organic stuff, we put in uh, ladybugs to, uh, to fight the uh, aphids. And then we, we, um, we put in, uh, it's called a mac wasp and that will kill uh, OFM, which is oriental fruit moth. So, so rather than spray to kill everything and just re running a really high toxicity spray program, we try to encourage the beneficials and then use, use more targeted specific products to, to uh, get rid of the, get rid of the uh, bad insects. I got another question. Have you tried uh, white peaches or nectarines or other uh, species? Yeah. Yeah. And what white peaches, white peaches are popular with some people, but the, it's, it's like a one in 10 kind of marketing. Um, so we, we could sell about a box per 10 boxes of, of yellow peaches. And that's why we've kind of steered clear of them. I have a bunch of test trees in the ground and I, I know which varieties I would go with if, if we did go that direction. But yeah, as of now, we, are, we haven't had um, enough demand to, to, really, to really go that direction. Nectarine, the nectarines here are amazing. Um, we have a lot of thrip here, which thrip marks the skin of the, of the fruit. And so the, the thrip is carried, the, the insect itself is carried in dust. And so um, when the wind blows, the thrips get in the orchard and, you know, it could be just a guy driving down a driveway or something, but we have a lot of marking on the skin and it makes it, it it's technically a number two peat or our number two nectarine when we finish growing it and so the college rate on them from what our test blocks show is like 
I'm going to say like 30, 40 percent foliage, which isn't really viable. So we can't go to we can't really go to market with them. It's the the issue there. If if people didn't if people didn't um, care about little lines on the fruit, then uh, then it would be fine. But you know, we we have to we have to meet USDA standards as well with with the quality. So that's been the issue with the with the nectarines. The nectarines are better than the peaches here. Um, you just can't commercially grow them for that reason. Okay, I have another question. Are sure. your local people the pickers or Hispanic or migrants that come in or how do you get your labor force? They're all guys on H2A visas that come in and um, and so they come up for pruning. This year has been weird with the uh, coronavirus. Um, but typically they come in and the guys come up in January and we, we have 50 guys that work at the farm. And um, so they'll come in at, in January and, and prune and we'll prune until uh, March, probably March 15th, call it. And then they'll go, we'll fly everybody back to Mexico. They'll hang out with their families and, you know, do their thing down there. And then they fly back roughly the 25th of April. And so once they're once they're back here, we we uh, thin, and then we go straight into cherry harvest, and then we and then the guys will either if if cherry harvest overlaps in like close to peach harvest, we'll just take a week off and hang out and kind of prep for uh, peach harvest, or uh, if if possible, we'll fly them back again, and they'll hang out with the families and and then come back uh, roughly July fifteenth to just to be a few days ahead of the season where we're getting getting ready to go to to start harvesting and then uh and then everybody will be here until probably the 20th of september more or less and uh 25th of september maybe and then uh and then uh usually usually the guys have a whole bunch of gear and stuff they bought and so they'll uh they'll they'll take you know take vans or or you know trailers and vehicles or whatever back back to mexico and so yeah and then we also hire a bunch of locals and um and you know just dependent we we're we're big uh, gas drilling area as well and so here on the western slope so so typically the majority of the really you know, the good workers are working in oil and gas here and so those are just really good paying jobs and so it's hard to compete but if we can get locals we we love to have them we got a okay. question from leona she asked, how many trees do you have? I know you mentioned that there's several different orchards working together. So, I mean, how? I think the last time I calculated, I think it's like 55,000 trees. Um, Jeez. Yeah. I far, we, we farm about 150 acres, me, me and my wife. And, um, yes, yeah, so we farm about 150 acres total and uh, on 21 different locations. So. Wow. We love each tree the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so I, a follow-up question about, you mentioned, you know, bugs and things like that, but Jerry, Jerry Lee Jensen was asking about, what about critters? Are birds an issue or not? Yeah, and we, we have, there's four bears on the farms right now. And um, there's a, a browner, there, it's a black bear, but it's a real brown colored one. And then there's three black bears, and one of them's really big. Um, and so we have we have bears, we have squirrels, we have uh, we have quite a few birds come through. Uh, birds and cherries are a big problem. So so we have these, they're like a propane cannon that we take out and shoot, um, and they they're just timed, and so it's it's they're really loud, and so they they scare off the the birds. And uh, we put up we put up uh, like plastic uh, owls and some junk like that. It doesn't seem to work very well for very long um but yeah it's it's there's always stuff out here and it's 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 fine it's just you know sometimes it's cost of do, doing business if the bears start tearing the trees down which they do um they'll rip the tree down and then they'll eat all the peaches once the tree's on the ground and so if that happens we we call a division of wildlife and we've only done it once but we trapped a bear last year that was causing a lot of damage and uh uh yeah it's it's definitely an issue um there's a lot of deer too so the deer will come in and uh when the bucks are in velvet they'll rake their horns on the little baby trees and then 
the deer also like to eat, um, they really like to eat the uh, leaves off the cherry trees because they're sweet, I think. And so they'll eat the, all the leaves off the baby cherry trees. So we have to spray those things with, I think you can spray them with some sort of hot sauce um, deal or there's this other product called Bob XR that it, it reeks, it, it tastes bitter. Apparently I've, I wouldn't even want to taste it, but, um, but yeah, we're constantly trying to keep, uh, we're trying to keep these animals out of the, especially the young trees, the older ones, you can have, you can have that happen a little bit and they can survive. But the young trees where we don't have any production, um, you got to be careful with. So I got a question on water. Do you have a water allotment or there, is there a shortage of water and, and how do you uh, cope with a drought? Yeah, there's always water concerns. We have some of the older water rights on the Colorado River and uh, we're allocated 4.8 gallons per acre um, uh, per 4.8 gallons per minute per acre, which is essentially, you know, five gallon bucket per minute um, per, per acre. And that's not much, that's not that much water. So what we have to do is we have to use these little, these sprinklers to efficiently deliver the water where, where we want it and not have over, not have any runoff. If we have runoff, then we, we essentially, we don't really have enough water to, to, you know, continue to farm the way we're doing it. Um, but yeah, it all comes out of the Colorado river and, and, um, on a drought year, uh, we compete with Denver for water here, here where we're at. So they're on the, they're on the Eastern slope of the Rockies. We're on the Western slope of the Rockies. And, um, it, the, with, with the, with the way the city's grown, they're using more and more water. And so it's, it's put a lot of stress on, on things around the state, but so far we've, so far we've been fine. I think, um, Two years ago, we were in a really bad drought, and uh, one of the power companies owns a bunch of water, and they donated it all to our valley um, for free, and kind of saved us the last, the end of the year. Nope they they didn't they didn't report that the water was gone until it was gone, and so it was difficult to pre-plan or do anything to to manage that. Um, it, it, you know the kind of what growers do if there is a drought that where you lose your water almost nearly completely is they'll cut the tree so if, say you have a tree like this and um they'll go in and they'll cut they'll cut like say this branch here right here if you can see my hand and they'll cut it here and th this will send out some new sh new shoots and so it's instead of having to uh in, instead of the water having to to manage the whole tree you're only your tree is now a little tiny tree that doesn't use nearly as need nearly as much water to survive and then when the water comes back you grow those new branches back out and it takes a year or two year, probably two years to kind of get back into a little bit of production but that's that's what like all the almond guys did in california when that drought annihilated them and um We've done it. I, I tried it in cherries just to test it to see if it worked and had great results with it. So I think that's a good way to conserve water is just to cut the tree way back, um, hopefully without killing it. So you probably want to leave one good branch in the following season, cut that, cut that other, the one good branch you leave, cut it off and use the other wood to, to regrow the tree. And that way you're not just removing all the leaves from it. You can also rejuvenate wood doing that. So if you have a bunch of uh, sunburned branches, you can go in and cut the, you can cut the branch off and it will send, it typically will send out new shoots, if, especially if the branch is healthy, you know, semi-healthy still. Um, but we, we don't really do a lot of that. We, we, we go in and remove full blocks and then replant them. And that way we have really health, just entire healthy block instead of kind of hit sparse hit and miss uh blocks where they're not not nearly as healthy but yeah what how long how long does it take from the time that you would plant a new tree or install a new tree to it bearing fruit um you get a little bit of production after four years but technically you, you don't get good production until year six or seven more or less is what we figure um so, so yeah, 
six, it's probably six to seven years to get the tree into production. If you are on that high density, um, if you're on that high density five foot by 15 foot uh, row spacing, um, you are uh, probably year three, you can start to get some production and year four, you start to get a lot more production. But the trees don't last as long in that system. So it's kind of a, you can trade making some money early on for how, losing the block or real early, or you can um, kind of invest more time and effort in it and, and let it, uh, let it mature. So. What, I know that sometimes we, we get asked this, at least when people are coming to pick up, what's the best way to care for my peaches? Yeah. Should I put them, yeah. In the fridge? Should I put them on the countertop? What, what would be your answer to that question? I would say if they want them, if they want them to last, if they don't want to use them right away, set out a few that they want to use sooner and then set them out on the counter and then leave the rest in the refrigerator for a couple of days or something. But if you, if you really, you want to, I mean, it's like any food, the sooner you use it, the better. So if you set it out on your countertop until they start to soften up a bit um, and then put them, refrigerate them once they're soft, uh, and eat them as as you as you know as as you will. That's probably the best best way to handle them. Um, I think there's I think there's directions on uh, on ripening on the side of the boxes as well. There should there should be I, as long as the box company print them right. So, <laughs> what um, how do you? I mean, what's is there like a famous way that peaches? Do you, everyone does everyone? I mean, is the best way just to eat them? raw or do you bake yeah them? i like to wash the buzz off just just rinse the buzz off and um and then uh bite into it and just eat it like that some people like to slice them or peel them or whatever i, I the skin doesn't bother me at all i i, I kind of like it um but you know everybody's got their everybody's got their way to eat a peach <laughs> some, people, some people slice them usually you don't have to put any sugar on these these peaches i mean um, occasionally, occasionally a peach will sneak in that's a little lower sugar content or, or whatever, but, but yeah, typically, um, typically you don't have to add much sugar to these things. So, um, yeah. Is this a, any other questions? Is this a family farm or how did you get into this? Well, my, I grew up doing it. Um, so I was, I was born on a peach farm and, um, with my dad did it. And then, uh, I went to, uh, I, I, I started leasing peat or orchards when I was in high school and kind of doing a little bit of farming on my own. My dad was helping me, um, loading me equipment and stuff. And then, uh, uh, I went to, I went to college and when I got out, I, um, I wanted to farm. And so my dad helped, uh, he co-signed for this farm that we're on right now. And, um, and, then I've just bought farms and I bought his business from him two years ago. So he's retired. And, um, but yeah, I've, I've been doing it my whole life. And then he did it or he farmed peaches. Um, uh, I think starting when he was about 25 years old. And, and so we were second, I'm second generation doing it. My brother's a farmer as well. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. I, 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 would like to say it's a great job but you know it's it has its days and it's i love uh shipping i love shipping good good fruit out that you know we take a lot of pride in it and um i i enjoy that aspect of it the day-to-day -day stuff can be rough but uh yeah I, I mean it can it can be horrible <laughs> in like frost frost season i think one of the worst years we we in a, april we have a lot of uh low temperatures here in colorado so um we run wind machines and then we also run these uh, sprinkler systems that we were looking at earlier for, to warm the orchards up a little bit. And I think we ran the worst year was like 17 nights out of 30, out of 30, basically out in April. And so you're up all night and then you're going to work the next day and everybody's showing up, you know, doing projects or whatever they're doing. So it's pretty sleep, a sleep deprived month. And then uh, harvest, we work probably, I think last year we were like 70 days uh, that were 12 hour days in a row with wow. no, I th we may have had one rainy day where we got a, we got kind of the day off. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty brutal. The winters, we, we don't, we don't work a lot in December just because it's cold and the guys are back in Mexico. So December we kind of relax and uh, part of maybe half of November and then we're back to pruning January 15th. And so it's a, it's a lot of, it's a ton of work. Um, I, I think, 
I totaled up where we had a hundred and some thousand hours on the farm, a hundred and something thousand hours combined with our crew. Um, last year, like maybe 115,000 call it or something. So we still, the guy, even though the guys take a lot, they're, they're back in Mexico a lot. We, we work such long days that they still get 2000, usually 2000 hours plus a year or so. Wow. You mentioned um, about frost. And I know there was a frost that killed off a bunch of peaches this spring. Yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, it, it was, uh, I'm going to say early April, I think. Um, I had I had coronavirus when that, when that frost hit. Oh, <laughs> I got, yeah. me and my wife got coronavirus like March 11th, starting March 11th. And so I was quarantined and the health department told me I could go out in my truck and drive around, but I couldn't get out of my truck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was trying to fix wind machines with, uh, uh, FaceTime and, and, you know, uh, but yeah, it got really cold. It, it was down to 20 or 21 degrees was our better in our better orchards. And then it was down to like, I think 18 degrees was the lowest and it was about that temperature for three hours. So, so it, it killed more or less, uh, 45% on paper of the fruits gone. And then we're having a lot of problems with split pits, uh, which means the bottom, let me see if I can find one here. So, um, where the stem connects into the tree, it opens up. Um, I don't, I don't see one out here, but, um, so we're, we're having a lot more college this year just because some of the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the peaches were damaged, but we, we sort those out, uh, we sort those out when the fruits graded and, um, but yeah, it, the frost, the frost this, this season, it was just a real dry, cold frost that was real uniform. And so, you know, usually we can beat it with the, with the uh, sprinklers and the wind machines, but this season we're, we're able to, so, you know, not, not what we wanted, <laughs> but, but it is what we got. So. Yeah. I, I, I got another question. Uh, some of my apple growers, they have uh, apple wood for sale. Do you sell any marketing with peach wood or does it have any? No, use we, we don't, we don't. It's, we really, a lot of guys get into stuff like that and I, I try to stay really focused on just growing peaches and, and doing a good job with that. I mean, there's a, a lot of guys grow four or five different crops. I grow cherries, peaches, and then a, a, a handful of wine grapes that I'm also getting out of that business and just going to try to focus on cherries and peaches only. Um, cherries, we need cherries because uh, we, need, we need work for the guys during that time, that time of the year. And so in order to keep everybody, you know, busy, we, we grow, we grow cherries to keep people busy. Um, we, the wine grapes, I've, I've torn out more wine grapes than the largest growers in Colorado have, um, just because we want to grow peaches. We love, we love fruit and we like working in the shade too. I mean, you can see like I'm standing in the shade here. And in wine grapes, you're out in the sun and just nobody, nobody really enjoys doing it. It's more of a commodity crop, whereas this is kind of a specialty crop that's, you know, the, the qualities directly reflects your work. Whereas wine grapes, you're kind of, you're almost trying to make them not grow, to stress them. And it's not that, it's not rewarding. Um, pe growing peaches and, and fruit is, 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 it just makes you feel good, you know? So... Interesting. But yeah. Anybody else have questions for Brian? I have a final question. So do you get any help from the university a specialist? Do you go to workshops or how do you Absolutely? Yeah, there's uh some horticulture shows that we go to to learn um, you know, what's kind of the cutting edge practices in, in fruit fruit growing and then um the, we have a CS, uh, Colorado State University uh, field office here in Grand, or in, it's nearby, um, it's 10 miles away or something, but um, they come out and do a lot of insect trapping and we work with them on some, you know, they always have some projects that they get funded and they're always milling around out here checking stuff and setting traps and hanging out and eating fruit. <laughs> but uh, 
No, I, I, I love having, uh, I love having them out here and, um, you know, they, they'll update me on any kind of insect issues that they're seeing in their traps. And then they use that data to kind of, uh, look, see what, what, uh, pest migration or is going on in the United States. So if, if there's some, uh, noxious pest that's come in from California or the coast or, or down South or something, um, they can kind of see the migration of those insects across the United States and, and, um, and try to help prevent that from being an issue, you know, in other, in, you know, in other uh, ag areas. And so, and sometimes the pests aren't really, they don't really affect our, our peaches, um, but maybe they'll affect something over on the front range, maybe, uh, maybe wheat crops or, or some, you know, I don't, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know, but um, it's good to keep, you know, keep up to date on what's going on there. We have like Japanese, a Japanese beetle here. Um, it's kind of just showing up and, uh, I think they're fairly easy to kill. It's just trying to monitor for them and make sure that we don't, you know, that they don't become an issue and, um, just, we just kind of prevent it as much as possible. And, and, you know, but, but yeah, there's always something. And each year, our climate, our climate, differs enough each year that some years mites won't be a problem but aphids will or some years um you, it's it's always changing and so we have we have to really be on our toes and adapt quickly and you know get things under control before they're a, a major problem so what what kind of cherries do you guys do you mentioned cherries now so um i do i do uh, uh quite a few i think i have i think i have five varieties of cherries and um we don't sell those out of state just because they're they're organic and they they go they're targeted into like the they're targeted into like the high end um organic food food stores here in Denver and we don't grow we don't grow a ton so those guys pretty much take every, take everything up that we we grow on on cherries um i i, I did ship them out of state for a bit but it, shipping costs are just so outlandish and you're you're not shipping that much volume and so so it just didn't make much sense hmm. but i i do tiatin being rainier sila um a numbered variety that's really early and and then i've got like <clears throat> four more four more early varieties uh planted and kind of ready to ready to go here as soon as they produce so sorry it's really hot here <laughs> um well, thank you so much, Brian, for, for absolutely a little, little tour. Yeah, absolutely. The, it's, a, it's a pleasure. I hope you guys all enjoy our peaches, and uh, we really appreciate you guys. All right. Hey, I'm going to just wrap up just by sharing a couple more things real quick about our, yep. our sale and our pickup. So thanks again for joining us, Brian. Uh, a couple things. So just as a reminder, for everybody, we're taking orders right now. Um, we expect to actually sell out by the end of this week on our orders of Colorado peaches. And we've been getting calls actually from some local grocery stores asking us, where are we getting peaches from because there's been, because of a late frost. So if you want to get some Colorado peaches, you got to order um, soon at yfcpeaches.org. We're planning on the pickup on August 13th and 14th from 9.30 to 5.30. Um, and I also put in here one of my new favorite recipes. We made a, a breakfast peach crisp, which was really good. It was mostly peaches with a little bit of crisp in it. We made that this last weekend. So I stuck that in the messenger there for you guys to enjoy. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you here in just a couple weeks when you come to get your peaches. Thank, Thank you again. Thank you. That's very interesting. <laughs> Great tour. Yeah, that was pretty fun to see, wasn't it? Yes.